My name is Nick Royak, and uh, I have been making movies for a long time now, ever since I was younger. But I've actually been making money in the industry for about 10 years now. So those are just jobs, uh, real grown-up jobs that I've been doing. Um, and uh, a lot of that has been like g and &E department stuff. A lot of that has been um, filmmaking, uh, camera work stuff. But it's also been like producing my own uh, content and getting it out there on the web. Um, and then I've also just recently started to build out a blog, which just is chronicling the industry and uh, kind of talking about the experiences that indie, uh, independent filmmakers share. But the real reason you all came here tonight was uh, I, I did a couple years of distribution with a company called Gravitas Ventures. And they're one of the largest uh, independent film distributors in North America. Uh, they do um, hundreds of films each year and they specialize in digital releasing. So I worked in their international uh, wing and our focus was to kind of grow out our reach for our independent filmmakers. So a film that was produced in uh, Oklahoma City, you know, would be screening to viewers in Hong Kong on iTunes. Um, or we would be working with Amazon to build out like a, a Japan um, marketplace for our films or even work in Europe. So I learned a lot, uh, well I learned everything I know about distribution from them, worked closely with the executives, it was a small group of uh, small companies, so it was really cool because I kind of got to see a lot of what was going on and uh, also worked with a lot of people on North America projects. So it wasn't all just you know, going out and uh, having a good time. It was a lot of, a lot of elbow grease. Um, so I came here tonight, like Adam said, you know, a lot of filmmakers, they, and we'll get into it more, but like they, they, they make a movie that they care about and that they put so much effort in and all of their crew put so much effort into. And then it's just kind of like, well, what now? So I came here to kind of like do two things tonight. The first is going to be, I'm going to try to like adjust our perspective a little bit as filmmakers, as independent filmmakers specifically. It's kind of like a red pill, blue pill moment, you know, um, where hopefully coming out of it, you'll have uh, fresh eyes as you approach your projects. And the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down some very um, kind of 101 information on distribution so that you guys kind of have some terminology and kind of like process behind what distribution is. And the reason is, is we could talk strategy. I could come up here with a bunch of slides and talk about windowing and shifting your film over here, and talking about film projections and estimates, and you got to do this, and you got to have this marketing. But none of that would make any sense if you didn't know what was happening beyond, uh, behind the scenes with distributors. If you didn't know what they were thinking, if you didn't know what terms they were using meant. So this is really just to kind of equip you all to be strong, independent filmmakers that are very, very informed. If you have more questions, you do want to talk strategy, please feel free to contact me later. You can either contact uh, you know, through Adam or you can grab my card after the presentation and we can have a, a, a much more in-depth discussion on how to strategize. Maybe you do have a film that's almost up for distribution, but we can talk about it more. So here we go. We're into that kind of perspective shift process right now and there's three things that I kind of want to convey to you guys to get that point across. And the first one is we're going to talk about the life of a film. For a lot of filmmakers, and this was my perspective before I worked at Gravitas, it, and this is like going through film school, and this was in, when I was in high school, and I'm like, I want to be a filmmaker, and I have all these great ideas, and there are all these little light bulbs exploding over my head. Like, I'm sure that's all of us in this room, right? So then you go out and you're like, I'm going to write this all down so that I can show this to people. And I am going to bleed out a nice 120 page screenplay that I'm going to force all these people to read. And my friends and family are going to have to read it and it's going to be cool. Or, you know, you're just sharing it with your cool supportive friends <laughs> and they're actually like, good job, good job, good job. And then you're like, great, now let's go rally the troops, I'm going to get my favorite DP, and I'm going to get a bunch of PAs who are going to work for bagels, and <laughs> I'm going to get, you know, all of my friends to run camera, and my mom and dad are going to be like the leads. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know you guys are much more professional than that. But anyway, then you go out and you shoot the damn thing, and that, <laughs> I mean, that is the real struggle right there. It's the best part and the worst part for all of us. It always is because it's the part that teaches you the most about yourself, it's also the most frustrating part 
and probably the closest you come to committing murder. <laughs> so um, after that, you finally take all of your golden nuggets of footage and you get into the editing suite and you're gonna add in music underneath and you're gonna color this and it's gonna be even more beautiful than when you shot it, unless you have a crazy DP, probably like Adam, who shoots it how he wants it to be seen. <laughs> um, and you're gonna get really close and finally you have a finished film that don't actually appear on film anymore. So that's not real. <laughs> 21st century distribution, everybody, right here. Anyway, here's the shift. Here's the first point of my shift. We have to stop thinking about this as the end. We have to stop thinking of this as our finish line. From here, we have the big screen, right? Everyone wants to be in the theatrical space. That's great. But now, in 21st century distribution, we also have the small screen, and we have the medium screen, and we have the portable screen, and we have the at-home screen. We have tons and tons of screens everywhere else that people are willing to watch it on. And they go through avenues like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and Apple and PlayStation and Xbox and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Everyone's there now. So what basically we need to stop thinking of is that a film just ends and a film really has an afterlife. And that's one thing I really want to convey to you tonight. That once your movie is done, if you're the producer or director of a film, you need to be thinking about the afterlife of your movie. You need to think about what happens after it screens for your friends and family. And you need to be thinking about that from the moment you have the idea. Not when you're writing the script, not when you're getting people together, not when you're shooting it. You need to have it from the beginning that my film has the potential to go on and be played on big screens, small screens, all the screens, from the moment I make it and complete it, pretty much into infinity. I mean, there are people now whose kids are inheriting their film rights. Let that sink in. Kids are inherit like families are, like, uh, great uncle Harry willed me, you know, slaughter zombies five, wow, <laughs> like, you know? But it's true, it's true. Once a film is made, it exists in perpetuity and it has the potential to, to surface. I have a friend, anecdote, I have a friend who uh, works uh, in distribution. He has a, a small little company, and it's like a small little boutique. And he was telling me, he was so excited. He's like, Nick, 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 I have, I, I, you won't believe it. I'm like, tell me, tell me. He's like, I found this movie that I'm just absolutely in love with, and I'm going to distribute it. And I'm like, awesome. Like, who made it? Do we know them? And he's like, no, it was made like 1978 in Australia. It's a musical. And I'm like, OK, tell me more, tell me more. And he's like, it's a musical that's like Mad Max meets Phantom of the Opera, and there's some blood and stuff like that. And he's just like, this film deserves to be seen. So a film made almost 40 years ago is resurfacing in the 21st century to a whole new audience. Imagine being that filmmaker who's just like, my film played a couple of festivals in Australia back in the day. It's, it played on TV a couple times. I built a website just for funsies. And now I have this young distributor talking to me about doing uh, international deals with like just getting it on Hulu, getting it on, uh, get, he was like working more towards like iTunes and Amazon Prime. But imagine that. That's crazy, you know? So think about afterlife. Remember the afterlife. Second thing is, thinking about your film, a lot of filmmakers, get to the end of that road and they have something there, right? It's just there. And they think of their film as a product. It's done. It's in their hands. And basically what they're going to do is they're just going to go and they're going to drop it off and somebody else is going to take care of it, right? I've, I, I'm guilty of that. I, that's how I used to think about movies. That I would make it and then it would suddenly do its own thing. But what we need to start doing, even as a director, and this is going to scare a lot of us because it's, it's challenging our creative self, right? is we need to look at our films as a business. And this, trust me guys, this isn't me from a, a business standpoint just like, all right everybody, my MBA tells us that we need to be doing this. It's from the perspective of a filmmaker who has seen filmmakers succeed and fail. And the ones who succeed really understand that that afterlife is like a business. And if you stop treating your film just as a product, that's just gonna get shipped around and people are gonna do stuff with it and more is like you own it and you can work with it and it's a living opportunity, those are the people who succeed. Because what happens is when it's a product, it's out of your hands. And you're kinda of like, all right, it's done. Trust me, 
I want you guys to keep going and making other films. So don't think that you have to stick with one film and just ride it out, because that's, that's not what I mean here. What I'm just saying is that there's a little bit more work to do after that first screening. Because on the other hand, you can guide it to success. A lot of the most successful filmmakers are people who are involved with their film and guide it along the way. They're tweeting about it, they're Instagram posting about it, it's Throwback Thursday, I was on this set, they're getting their crew to talk about it. It's the producers and, and, and the directors in the indie space that are really guiding their films to success that actually achieve success. If you treat your film like a product, you have random opportunity. Oh, it might get on Netflix. Oh, I don't understand how it gets on iTunes. It just might because it's just a product. But if you're looking at it as a business, you have strategic exposure. You come up with a plan. You're looking at it. It's a business plan. It's literally a business plan. And there's nothing more healthier for your film success than looking at it from that perspective. You're looking at it as a finished task. We kind of went through that with the afterlife. But as a business, it's a living opportunity. It's constantly something that can give back to you. It's something day to day that if you're involved with, will return to you and it will start to give back. I really love this one. As a product, a lot of times filmmakers, independent filmmakers are left in an isolated effort. Everyone's like, great, we finished it, see you later. And they're just left alone to try to figure out how to leverage their film into something else. But if you treat your film like a business, from that idea, like we talked about, from the very beginning, you're going to create a team directive. Your director of photography, he is going to be making sure that they have behind the scenes posts of his crew out on Instagram. All of your PAs, send, send me your behind the scenes photos. I know you're taking them, even though it says no photos on set. <laughs> but make it a team directive. Pro, like put those things out in the world in a, in, a, in, a, in a strategic exposure and all of a sudden your team becomes involved. And after the process is finished, their pride that they've invested in your business is still there. So if you're thinking of it as, as the director and the producers at the top, you got the camera crew and the DP under there, you got everyone else underneath, but we're all a team and you give that team directive to your crew as a business, like a business mentality, they will help push that film even after it's done. So just keep that in mind. It just helps keep everything alive and keep things involved. Do panels with your cast. You know? Have your DP come along and talk about the film. Publish papers where you know, the, the costume designer was talking about, oh, hey, like I had this idea behind the main costume, and I wanted to do this. That's just more material for people to bump into while they're out in the world and they're going to see this team working together, and they're going to be impressed, and they're going to know that there was some serious effort put into this. Finally, another really po uh, a point that I really love is look, when you look at it as a product, it's just kind of mysterious money. It's kind of like, oh, maybe somebody will buy this, or maybe somebody will be interested in this. Maybe somebody will put some money down for this. It's mysterious. You don't really know where it's going to come from. People are just going to happen. But if you treat your film as a business, and you have the plan and you have the strategic exposure and you have the team working on it, what's going to happen is you're going to start running into profitable equity. People are going to say, we understand that you went through a process, we understand that you have a, a plan in place, and we understand that you understand where you came from. As Adam pointed out, a lot of people just rack the credit card and then they're just like, we're done. What if you were saying, listen, we have the idea, we have the script, we have everyone involved, ready to go. This is how much it's going to cost, and this is how much we think we can make back. Wouldn't you feel much better about going into a situation like that if you had that kind of plan in place? If you said, listen, it would just take one deal to get us back. It would just take one, you know, a couple deals here, a couple deals there to piecemeal everything back, and we'd break even. Not to mention, your film living on into infamy just keeps sending you checks, you know, as you go, and then you inherit, you know, to your kids. It's like, hey, guess what you're getting for Christmas? <laughs> you know, like, my movie that I made 30 years ago. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> They'll probably love your films. Um, so yeah, so, so stop thinking of your film as a product. Start thinking of your film as a business, even for creative people, even as a director. Keep it in the back of your mind. Let it be a little tug of war between left brain, right brain, okay? Don't ever put to death you know, the creative aspects of you just to sacrifice for the business aspects of you. But if you're a director or a producer or a writer who just thinks 
in ways that will you know, bring the team together and make things look like a profitable source, you're going to have a lot more interest and you're going to have a lot more leverage later on. So now we're going to talk about you guys, the filmmakers yourselves. Um, so the first thing we talked about shifting was how you look at your movie and how it has an afterlife to infinity. We talked about how you're going to shift your perspective on a film from a, a product to a business and how that brings a lot of life to your film. And now we're going to talk about you yourselves. I'm going to give you three quick tips. Distributors like certain types of filmmakers and they don't like certain other types of filmmakers. But one of the biggest keys that they love is they love filmmakers who are informed. That means go out, read IndieWire, a lot of you probably already doing that, read IndieWire, read Deadline, any type of new technology that comes into the film space, read about it. One of my favorite things to read about right now is MoviePass. How many people have MoviePass? I mean, it's pretty incredible, right? I, it's bad though. I'm like, I'm like going every you know night, and like my girlfriend's like, we gotta stop, like you know, like I'm too worn out. Not another superhero movie, that sort of thing. But understand that just last, just late last month, MoviePass announced they're gonna start co-distributing films. That's huge, because not only is their directive, this is like a little segue. Not only is the directive like data driven movie market stuff, they're going to say, hey, we can put this film in X you know, theaters around the country and it should be okay. It should make a profit. Isn't that every independent filmmaker's dream? If movie pass is on your side and says we will theatrically release your film and the other distributor is like, oh, well if movie pass is involved then it's pretty guaranteed to make some money at the box office. We'll pick up digital on the back end. But you need to be informed of those trends so that in the conversations with distributors, you could bring it up. And when you bring that up, distributors are like, whoa, we got, we got a live one here. Like, we got people, who, these people know what they're talking about. One, that helps them respect you more. Two, that really puts a boundary on it so that they're not going to just bully you into things that you don't want to do. Not there's a lot of great distributors out there. I want to make that very clear. There's a lot of distribu distribution companies that treat their filmmakers great, but there's also ones who will just kind of like be like, hey, we love your film. And you're like, wow, somebody wants my movie. And that's great to hear. And then you sign, and then they don't do what they said that they're going to do, or it's just a modified version of that. So also, this, that, be informed applies to that. If, if you get to a table with somebody that you've researched that day because you knew they were going to be at the festival, and you're like, hey, it was great meeting you, shake their hand, be nice, but you know you're not going to do a deal with them because you know that you've seen other filmmakers do deals with them. Okay, so be informed. Be creative. We all love this one, right? This is like pretty much opposite of what I was just telling you on the last slide, to just be business oriented. But keep that creative self alive and motivated. Um, distributors love filmmakers who bring them creative ideas on how to get their film out there. So keep that, that creativity pumping, keep it going, keep it alive, because when you sit down and you're like, hey, we have some ideas for marketing, and you just signed, or you just emailed them, we have ideas for marketing, they're going to love that. They're going to know you're in it. They're going to know that you're ready to go. And the last thing is be hardworking. Distributors love filmmakers who hustle, not just to produce a film, but to expose their film. They like to see that the amount of effort that they're going to put in is going to be matched by the filmmaker. They love to see filmmakers who understand that their, life has or their, film, their film has continued life after they're done with it, and they're going to keep working hard to make sure that the most people see it on the big screen, small screen, and all the other screens in between. Okay? So just remember that. Be informed. Keep coming to meetings at Lightbulb. Be creative. Keep reading, keep writing, keep watching, and be hardworking. Just follow what your parents told you. <laughs> okay, now we're getting into the nitty gritty stuff. We're gonna talk about who distributors are. Can anybody like name any distributors, like or you know know any? What's up? Oh, there's Scrimtas, there's Blinko. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> got it. Got me. Okay, so he's got Gravitas, which is cheating because I said that at the beginning. Well, but he said Roadhouse, which is a good one. That's a great independent distribution company. Yes. Synetic, yes. Journeyman. I, what was that? Journeyman Films. Journeyman. Yeah, they, yeah, Journeyman. Yeah, they're, they're, 
they're definitely up and coming. I was thinking A24 is a great distribution company that's doing a lot of cool stuff right now. Yeah. Um, you got FilmRise, which just opened up in New York and doing a lot of work. And, but you really have distributors on both coasts, so it's not exclusive to LA or New York. And then you have some that are even um, stationed in other places. But um, it was really great. Thank you for those guys. So basically, when you run into a, a distribution company, the idea is that they're going to have a structured team. And it's usually five or more people in specific roles. That's just, I put that in there specifically because if you run into people who have smaller teams than that, they're more like sales agents or kind of like me, they're acting as like a distribution pr um, producer, kind of like a consultant that's working with uh, filmmakers to get that film to the greatest distribution market they can. But a distributor is very structured um, in the sense that it has departments. Another thing, and this is a key point, so uh, dis uh, distributors, their sole focus is on distribution. They are business first and foremost. My boss, uh, uh, Michael Murphy at Gravitas Ventures, would often tell me, amazing distributor, by the way. Go look up the Gravitas story. It's really incredible. Um, he always told me that, Nick, I'm not here to be a tastemaker. I'm here to do business. And he said that with respect, and he said that in honesty. And I, I can appreciate that, because their goal is to make sure that they're doing, turning a profit, you know, which is, this is all business talk, yada, 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 yada. But like, the, the idea is that don't go in there and thinking that they're like these very artsy people. A lot of them are creative, but they're not there to be the academy. You know what I'm saying? Kind of get where I'm going with this? They're going to be talking about business terms. They're going to be talking about your film as it pertains to business, which is a good thing for you, because if you're in that meeting, that means you're talking about the future of your film and the profitability of your film. Um, and then some of them are boutique or quantity. Some of them are uh, like A24 is very focused on theatrical and making sure that they're, they're, they obviously have a digital back end, but A24 does a lot of theatrical. Gravitas does massive library pro, uh, procurement where they will take those old movies and they will purchase them in bulk and make sure that they go up in bulk. And that idea is just that they are kind of putting as much out there as they can, and they're exposing a lot of films at one time. Where A24 might do you know, a film every three or four months, do a theatrical run, and kind of go that route. And then, um, oh, one cool thing, curi curated co uh, collections. Excuse me. Um, Kino Lorber's in New York, and they're kind of like the Criterion Collection of independent films. It's really cool. They, they do like very old school kind of movies or very art house kind of films, and those are really the only ones they touch. But it's awesome because their viewers and their people that come to them and their partners all know what they're getting. They're getting these really cool art house films. And Kino Lorber really helps uh, keep that market alive. Excuse me. Real quick, any other questions so far? I know I breezed through a lot. I know I talk really fast. You guys kind of getting where I'm going with a lot of this? Okay, cool. Feel free to raise your hand at any time, participate, chime in. Um, this isn't college classroom, you know. Uh, really quick, I want to talk about the structure for you guys so that you guys can kind of understand. If you bump into somebody and they say, hey, I'm in sales at a distribution, you'll kind of know what their role is and you know how to leverage that role into other opportunities for you. So it starts at the top. The executive, um, they all they have the ultimate say and the vision direction for the company. Again, my old boss used to say, because he was very, they're very, very independent film based. So they couldn't go out. He said, I can't risk the company on one film. So he couldn't go out and purchase the rights to a film for $5 million when that was like 80% of their acquisition budget for the year. You understand? Because like that film would have to make what all the other films you could buy for $5 million, it would have to make all of that for one film, right? So that, those guys and girls are kind of like the ones who are like driving the wagon, you know what I'm saying? Sales, they're the people who get movies out there and visible. They're the ones who develop relationships with Hulu and Netflix and Amazon and all the platforms. They're the people who are on the front line saying, hey, I got this really cool film. You know, you got to see it. It's up and coming. It's amazing. Or it's got so-and-so in it. These people, awesome. If you run into them, 
they're really cool people. They talk faster than me. <laughs> but uh, definitely download what you can from them because they're going to know what trends are going on. They're going to know what's hot. And they're going to want to talk to you about where your film fits into the market. So definitely talk to salespeople. Accounting, math and money. I think that's all I have to say about the county, right? <laughs> I don't want to talk anymore about the county. You probably won't meet them because they usually hang out in their office. Yeah, go ahead. So the salespeople are going to be going to film festivals maybe? Or? So yeah, that's, we're going to get to that one in a second. Sales guys are usually like more like in the corporate headquarters. They're usually the ones who are more on like the film came in and now they're the ones taking it out. So I, I, I love this slide. These are the people you want to make your friends. These are all the people that you, if you know them or know that you have a cousin that knows one, get an introduction. Operations people, these are the people who are in charge of formatting and delivery of your actual film. If they email you, say your film gets picked up by a distributor, and somebody from operations emails you, reply back right away. Even if it's like, hang on, I'm not at my computer, I'll be right back. Be nice to them because they have one of the hardest jobs in the industry. Their job is to coordinate, especially these big markets or big distribution companies. Their job is to make sure all the hard drives with all the films on them are going to the right labs to make sure that you get the right languages and the right subtitles and then it's delivered to Hulu and then that one's delivered to you know, Netflix in, in Portugal. Like These people's lives are crazy. But if you're friends with them and if you're timely with them, they'll respect you and make sure your film gets delivered to the right place at the right time. So make sure you're friendly with operations. Marketing, you're going to have a lot to do with them. It's pretty self-explanatory. They're your best friends after your film is, uh, is, is purchased because they're the people that are going to be saying like, oh, your film is about ping pong. This is real life. Let's just sell a bunch of ping pong paddles. Let's put it on a website. You can buy ping pong paddles with the characters' faces on them. You know, like these are the people who are working with you to develop these cool ideas and, and get your film out there in creative ways. So make sure you're responsive, uh, responsive to them. These are also the people, remember, be informed, be creative, be hardworking, be creative. That kind of applies to these guys right here. Make sure your creativity is on when you're talking to them. And then finally, like you just asked, acquisitions. These are the gatekeepers of the film business world. These are the people that will see your film and fall in love, or they'll see your film and you'll have to sell them a little bit, or these are the people who you're going to get a no from and then you're going to prove wrong later on. <laughs> but acquisitions are the people who are at the festivals, they're at the markets, their job is strictly based on finding the next film for their company. That job is uber cool, ultra fun. It's a lot of stress, but it's still very cool. Um, so anybody you know in acquisitions, make sure you're, you're really tight with them. Okay? Be friends with these people. That does it for the structure. Uh, one more note before we get into this is the film distribution world is not very siloed anymore. So if you like talk to somebody in marketing, it doesn't mean that they're like on the bottom rung and they don't have any pool. A lot of these companies are more like a big circle in the middle with the executive and then sales, marketing, you know, it's, it's not siloed anymore. It's very much just a collaborative switch hats every day kind of thing. So make sure that you treat everybody you meet with like the potential that, hey, you're in, I just met you at the bar and you're cool, we talked, and you're in operations at a distribution company, but we had a fun time. Would you like get my film to acquisitions? And they'd be like, yeah, man, totally. Like, that was so cool last night when you did karaoke, you know, like, so just, Keep that in mind. You never know. Um, Adam and I talked about this. It comes with a caveat before. This is kind of the shopping list that they look for. Details about films that distributors like. If your film doesn't match these, don't change your movie. If you have an incredible, you know, we're going to talk about genre. If you have an incredible LGBT like drama that is very just like rough and real, don't think that it doesn't qualify for incredible distribution. You know, if you have an awesome story about, you know, a documentary about inner city schools, don't think that it's not going to go anywhere. This is not a, like penultimate. Nothing passes this. You know what I'm saying? So don't change yourselves as filmmakers. Don't change your film. Just know that this will help in certain cases. And if you do have all this, great. Go get your film out there because it's going to be looked for. They're looking for content, movies and documentaries, feature length, 
or 20 minute episodic. I don't know a lot of acquisition companies that are acquiring episodic. It's usually people who are producing episodic for a specific platform, but I know that it does happen sometimes. This rules out short films, sorry guys. I've only seen one company that really handles short films, and I'm not sure how they're doing in recent years, but. Um, so yeah. If you're lucky, it'll be part of a collection somewhere. You can kind of leverage it like that. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a short film successfully monetized. Um, it's just, it's tough. Like maybe you could talk about working with some people. A lot, of, a lot of smart horror guys, what they do is they build an anthology and then put it in a movie theater. Yeah, back there. What about short films as proof of concept? Short films proof of concept. Okay, that's a good question. Um, that's not going to get distribution. A, a proof of concept is more for a production company. So if you have a short film that's proof of concept for a feature, you want to go to production companies. Because distributors, remember like we said, are really more business oriented. They want to talk about completed projects rather than in the works projects. Sometimes um, as you grow through your career, uh, distributors will come in at the back end or early onset of pre-production and say, hey, we'll like, have a guarantee at the back end that we'll purchase your film and we'll distribute it for you. And that gives you some money to produce it. But they just disguise it as like, we're pre-buying your film. Just think of it that way. Sure. What about web series? Web series, um, how long episode? How, how long is the episode? Say the 10 minutes. If you're going to do a web series, I think there's probably a lot of platforms out there that you would be better off self-distributing and working around some sort of like, either merchandising or working around like ad spend, like on YouTube, stuff like that. You, get, you know what I mean that way? I, I'm just saying that because don't bother trying to sell it to somebody. Just go do it yourself because you'll just reap more benefits. So yeah, web series. Any other questions? Because I, I noticed that piqued a lot of interest. Sure. Good question. So what is the minimum maximum to be considered a feature film to a distributor? I've seen 60 minute documentaries purchased. So like 60 minutes are great because, or 50 to 60 minutes, because a distributor who has strong TV connections can get your documentary on TV. And then they can also send it to other platforms. But anything below that is going to be really a tough sell. Um, there, it would be hard to sell a 40 minute film as like a feature film. See what I'm saying? So 50 and up, 50 and up. What I tell a lot of filmmakers is a good idea. This is great, I'm so glad you guys are responding to this. Um, have your full cut of the film and then have a 50 minute cut of your film. If it's a narrative, that's a little harder. <laughs> You're just like missing like a whole 40 minutes of your movie and people are like, wait, what is this? Um, if you have a documentary and you can cut it down to 50 minutes, sometimes your distributor can sell that to TV networks around the world and just say, hey, I got a 50 minute cut of this documentary. You can put it on your TV station in your hour, hour window. And they're like, awesome. Because what are they going to do with 82 minutes? It's like, oh, uh, we got to have so many commercials, blah, 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 blah. But if you're just boom right there, you know, at that 50 minute mark, that helps sell it. So just keep that in the back of your head too. If you're working on documentaries, anybody who's working on documentaries. Sure. Yeah, I would say, I, like, I have seen a like 65 minute feature film come across my desk. So that's not really a I mean, I, I don't. I mean, that film was purchased and worked with before I was there. Or, or like, like, it was yeah, it was purchased before I was at the company, so I didn't handle it personally. But I did see it in our catalog. So they acquired it. But the majority of films lie between 75 minutes, I would say, is a good bottom line, up to however long you want to make it. Does that help answer your question about length? I would say the minimum 75. Yes? Since you mentioned it, um, how often have you seen like, this trail come involved like, in, the, in the front end of things, like in the development of pre? Uh, is, it, is it an often thing that happens, like help secure funding, or in your experience? I would say that. That happens mostly when the filmmaker or the filmmaking team have at least a couple features under their belt. I've never seen it happen 
for like somebody who came out of the blue and had a script that was so brilliant. Yeah, usually what happens, if you have a, a fantastic script that gets in the right hands, they're gonna purchase the script and produce it and already have those things set up. But if we're talking about strictly independent film, to get a distributor involved early on, you're gonna need either A, to have like a couple films under your belt already, or B, some insane cast who can really kind of like, the, the agency at that point maybe would start ledger, like leveraging and you know, knocking elbows with people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of these questions we'll handle in the Q and A. Just to wrap that one up about the short, you know, when to present the uh, short film. It's always great to have your stuff online so that people can see, hey, this filmmaker is actually doing stuff. Okay. So yeah, so definitely. But if you want to talk more about it, bring it up at the end, or we can talk about it one on one. Just to get through this shopping list. So we talked about the content, cast. I was getting into that a little bit. Recognizable faces, tried and true or fresh and new. I was like, I wrote that down like, yeah, it rhymes. <laughs> but it really applies. Anybody who's like old school from a great movie in the past or anybody who's like brand spanking new and like just hot at the moment, they can really change the trajectory of your film in distribution. This is crazy. Um, a lot of times, Tom Sizemore, I saw him in a couple comedies that were just terrible. But people watched him because Tom Sizemore was in him, you know? And I was just like, wow, Tom Sizemore. But then another great example on the other end of the spectrum is uh, Matthew Gray Goobler, is that his name, right? From Criminal Minds. He was in an indie comedy that really helped propel the film even after the distributors got involved. They didn't realize what they had on their hands. But there's a lot of ladies who like Matthew Gray Goobler. So that, that helped out in the long run. Um, Anyway, uh, so think about cast. If you have any shot at getting cast, even if you have to wait a little bit, even if you have to try to get a little bit more money, even if you have to try to like pull a couple more strings, try to do it. Because if you get this, I'm gonna tell you what guys, I'm not gonna lie to you. If you get a cast in your film, you're pretty much guaranteed a deal at the back end. Just saying. At any, if it's a TV recognizable face or a movie recognizable face, it's going to make the difference in your film. That being said, you can still make a fantastic movie with rising stars or with just really good actors. Some people can make great films with terrible actors, <laughs> as we've seen. Genre, um, horror or sci-fi movies can transcend international boundaries. A lot of distributors like this because it just seems that these types of movies can be watched by audiences around the world and not much can be missed. Uh, I was actually just having a conversation with Shar earlier about drama and how it could be tough for people in different markets to understand how something is dramatic because it's from a different part of the world. Um, or they just, uh, a comedy is an even better example because a joke might not translate. It might actually translate more offensively. Um, but if your film is a genre film, this is really great because uh, people like sci-fi, people like horror. Um, so that can help you in their shopping list. Um, big followings involved. I've I, I stumbled upon something the other day. Any type of WWE documentary made in the past 10 years has eight stars on IMDb.com, amazing Rotten Tomatoes reviews, and it's on every platform I could ever find it on. If there is a big following for something that's attached to your documentary or to your film, there's a good chance that distributors would love to get involved. If that's the case, make sure that's in your pitch. Make sure that's in your first meeting. Make sure that's one of the first things out of your mouth. Hey, Jake the Snake is in my documentary. Jake the Snake is in my film. Oh, WWE, you know, it's boom. It's right there. So if you have a big following, that's gonna help you out a lot. Uh, time, oh, right? what was that? They did that through Distributor, the renovation of Jake the Snake. Yeah, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, a distributor, for those who don't know, is a self-distribution platform, which that to me is kind of like a whole nother distribution discussion um, because there's big pitfalls with that. And there's a lot of merit to working with a real distributor because not only do they have the right connections, they also have the process down pat. So, but you're definitely right, sir. That was Jake the Snake with uh, Distributor. Um, uh, where was I? Oh, timeless, the timeless versus flash docs, uh, balancing relevance with transcendence. Um, I just want to illustrate the points for you guys who are in documentary filmmaking. 
Hero Dreams of Sushi, right? A lot of people know that documentary. What's great about that movie is it really is like timeless. I feel like you could watch it at any time and it would be meaningful to those who view it. But when I was at my company, we worked on distributing a Bitcoin documentary and this was like years ago. And at the point, it was very fresh and new and very exciting, so it did well initially. But now years later with Bitcoin having such a different role in like modern economics, that film is not relevant anymore. So it's not really doing it's not really doing what it was doing because now there's new and fresher documentaries out on Bitcoin. So just keep that in mind. If you're making documentaries, try to find that thread that is <coughs> transcendent um, really of, of kind of the theme that you're portraying. And then finally, merchandising. Um, if you have some cool ideas to go along with merchandising, that doesn't necessarily like mean like, hey, my movie is about like these little cockroach, it's a cockroach horror film. You know, they eat everybody, so we want to do plush cockroaches with blood coming out of their mouth. <laughs> That's a sick idea. <laughs> that might actually work now <laughs> in today's world. But um, it doesn't mean every idea that you have is going to go through. A uh, great example of this when I was at Gravitas was somebody made a film called Unbranded. Has anybody ever heard of that documentary? Okay, it's okay. It's a brilliant, it's a beautiful documentary, I should say, about um, these guys who moved wild Mustangs from a part of Texas to a sanctuary in another part of the country. And they were very, very smart and they were thinking ahead. Remember the afterlife of the film? They not only like took great footage from the film, but they took phenomenal photographs as they went and they created coffee books and plates and these amazing posters afterwards that were merchandise. And what I remember was just seeing how the film sales were going up, but also how the merchandising was almost matching it. So they effectively doubled what they were making off the film by using that foresight to create smart merchandising that really didn't cost that crazy amount. It was just printing books and doing some other stuff. So it's not like you're making plush horses, which probably still would have sold um, for that film. So this is just kind of like a little checklist. Again, remember, your film doesn't have to apply to all of these. Don't quit if it doesn't, but just think about how you might incorporate some of these as you go along. Um, so now we're going to dive in. I'm going to speed it up a little bit just you know, so that I kind of wrap it up and we'll get into the Q&A. But we're going to talk about what you're selling. You're going to keep your film. Okay? Anybody who's like, I want to buy your film from you and I want to take it, don't. Just walk away. <laughs> just, <laughs> just walk away. What you are actually selling is the rights to your films. So you're giving somebody the right to go out and to put your film in markets and to make money that they will benefit from and that you will benefit from. Okay. Keep your film, sell your rights. Uh, and then we're just going to talk about the rights. There's seven of them I'm going to highlight here. These are the most like uh, uh, the most tried and true, the ones that are always talked about, and the ones that are always brought up. Theatrical rights, which are rights pertaining to playing in theaters. There's limited or wide. Um, this is basically just somebody acquiring the rights to show your movie in movie theaters. Okay, and this applies um, to any type of like organized venue. Uh, so, anybody here of Tug? Anybody here of Tug? Kind of? Yeah, Tug's the company that um, said, you know, if you're a filmmaker and you want your film to show in Cleveland, Ohio on the screen, if you get enough people to buy tickets in advance, then you can screen your movie at that movie theater, okay? Those are theatrical rights. Not in the traditional sense, but in the new sense. Television rights, pretty straightforward. Rights granted for TV screenings. I think everyone's got that one. Um, educational. This is an emerging field of rights geared towards educational markets. Sometimes, uh, you know, I was an RA in college and we would like buy like Jaws and put it up on a screen in the rec pool and everyone would be swimming and Jaws would be playing. We had to get the educational right to screen that film in the pool at my institution and we went through an educational um, platform. So it wasn't a distributor, it was a platform. So they sent us the DVD, we paid them a fee, and uh, then the distributor and the filmmaker obviously split that. So this is an educational market. Um, I say emerging because there's a lot of companies that are entering the space. If you have somebody who's very, if you have a documentary, and you have somebody who's very educational, like, oh, we're trying to figure out this educational thing, that's exciting because you could kind of be like a groundbreaking film in that area. So just keep that in mind. Here's the fun stuff. This is the 21st century part of my presentation right here. These three terms, TVOD, SVOD, and AVOD. TVOD 
is transactional video on demand. This is what I learned in like the first couple weeks in distribution. I was like, what? You know, like, I just know focus, iris, color correction. You know, like these are the things that I was getting to know. Um, every time someone views it, they pay. Can anyone, like, if, if this is clear, can anyone name a platform that does transactional video on demand? ITunes. Yes. Anybody else? There's a couple other ones out there. Vimeo on demand. Vimeo on demand. That's a good one too. Um, this is anytime somebody pay, clicks pay now and their credit card is charged just for one film, this is tra transactional video on demand, okay? And that's exactly right. iTunes, th that, I worked with them extensively. They, they were uh, really strong for a while, but now things are changing for them. <laughs> anyway, um, so moving on, subscription video on demand. So the S is for subscription. Viewers find content via a uh, platform they pay for. What's the big one here? Netflix. Say it out loud, Netflix. All right, cool, yeah, and there's a lot of other ones. Um, there's, yeah, Hulu, Aspen, yeah, Voodoo. I love, I love that you brought that up, because like, Hulu, or Voodoo is like Walmart's, yeah, yeah, Voodoo, yeah, 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 and I was like, whoa, like, this is crazy. So subscription video on demand, basically the platform is curating films, they're paying for a long contract with that film, and then you just pay 10 bucks a month to watch whatever you want. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. And then AVOD, which is advertising. Viewers pay nothing, ad revenue for the platform. YouTube, great. Uh, also Hulu and Crackle. Crackle was back in the day. And they're still kind of chugging along. Um, these kind of like have different deals. They kind of have like different ideas. They have different like promotions. Like a lot of times in transactional, you want to make sure all your marketing is up front so people see it and then they buy it and it's click, 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 click. Here, you want to make sure that you have a strong distributor that has a strong relationship with the subscription platform so that they can make sure that it's placed up high on the list so that you can see it. Apple is really the only one that I can think of that is really transparent about how their algorithm works. Like if you get a lot of views, then your documentary or film goes up. Other platforms are a little more like they curate it or they'll put it where they think it goes. But Apple was awesome because you could get an independent doc up in the top 10 and it could stay there for a really long time. Um, and then AVOD, that's kind of like you want to make sure that um, the filmmaker is doing a lot of marketing themselves and it's a lot of word of mouth so that people can just discover it for free and get out there. So these are, the, these are like the new digital rights, okay? So these are like the things that are different that filmmakers are looking down and saying like, wow, like these are a lot of new opportunities. And then, I uh, see your hand. I'm just gonna do one more. Physical, DVD distribution. Physical is not dead. It's not, surprisingly. People like their uh, cool boxes and their collector's editions. I know I do. I just got the Lord of the Rings collector edition, like the extended version for Christmas. I was like, yes. Um, there goes 12 hours of my life. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm like, and I'm, if I do that for like another five times throughout my life, that's like, what, 60 hours? <laughs> I just like throw on to Lord of the Rings. Anyway, uh, did you have a question, sir? About yeah, you might answer it, so I'll just Cool. Really quick, I want to talk to you guys about these rights really quick. There's seven different rights here, and they're all related. This goes into the strategy stuff. I'm not going to get into it now, but basically, if you're curious about how all these work, because it's not like, a distributor goes, all right, ready? We're gonna push the button. Everybody ready? Got their champagne flutes? We're gonna push the button, boom. Goes to theatrical, goes to Netflix, goes to Amazon, goes to iTunes, goes to Hulu, goes to DVD, all in one day. It's not how it works. Because you would burn off your own business. You would collapse windows, and that's what's so crazy about the market right now, is everyone's trying to disrupt, but then certain people are trying to just figure out what's the best way to do it. So there's a strategy to this. There is a rhythm to this, and this is where it kind of comes into finding the right distributor, because you want to hear their plan and you want to trust their plan, okay? So when you talk about rights, make sure you're informed, but make sure that you understand what their plan is. And if they don't have a plan, either ask them for one, make them have one, or say, I gotta find somebody else, okay? Cool. The other aspect, really quick, you're, se you're keeping the film, you're selling your territories. Um, I'm just running through, each country is recognized as a territory, but they have regions, um, which a lot of times are purchased in parcels. So you have North America, which is really just Canada and the United States. Uh, then you have Latin America, which is 
the peninsula and everything Latam, and you know they're divided up, but they're recognized as Latin America. Uh, you have Europe um, that pretty much just goes all the way up to Russia and the Middle East and then Africa, and sometimes they'll, they'll um, cut off the Nordics. I feel so funny, like I'm like, chop this off and get rid of this. But uh, it's true, it's like each individual market has its own characteristics. Um, again, a lot more detail, a lot more strategy, but just know that these are the big general ones. Then you have um, Australia and the islands, the Philippines here in New Zealand, and like, there's actually some more that they kind of include and they call it Oceania, Oce Oceania, Oceania? Um, and this is all one region, and then you have Asia, which uh, all the big markets there. Um, I could really just chop off Russia. Russia. Russia is so strict with their film market that a lot of films, especially independent ones, just will never be seen there. Just it's part of who Russia is. <laughs> Same thing with China. It can be difficult, but you can find distributors who have the right inroads, and you can uh, work it out. And then finally, Africa and the Middle East. This is a super tough market, guys. Not a, not a lot is known here. There's a lot of censoring that happens. So it's just, this isn't a big, a big territory to worry about. It's really the other ones you really want to put your focus on. Not to say you should write it off, because who knows? You might have a crazy following in South Africa, and that would be sweet. Um, so think about it. You got your rights, and you got your territories. You put all those together. That was like seven rights, and I think I outlined like six territories. So that's like 42 individual rights for just one film, just considering the combinations of region and rights. That's 42 things that you can work with a distributor on make, turning a revenue for you. You know, That's 42 little uh, operations going on that have a lot of potential. That's how you got to treat it. And that's why I want you to think of it as a business rather than as a product. Because a product is one thing. A business has multiple facets. You have 42 facets. And if you want to count all the countries, all the combinations of that is like, a, like around 1,300. And that's when you consider like somebody's like, you know, I have a really great, like I'm a distributor from India. And I have, I, I have a platform. I own a TV network. I have theaters there. I, but I don't operate outside of India. So I just want to buy India and all your rights. So you sell them those seven rights for India. But you still got all of the, these rights to work with. But if you're smart and you're diligent and you work with your distributor, you can really push a lot of these to be successful markets. And that's what a distributor wants to see out of a filmmaker, somebody who's like thinking on a global scale. One last note, not all territories are created equal, like I pointed out. Uh, Africa and the Middle East can be really tough to break into, but if we're, you know, we're English speakers, we make a lot of English speaking movies. It's anything, Australia, England, um, New Zealand, surprise, Hong Kong is huge for English speaking languages. So just think of it like that. Like those, those territories right off the rip you should be going for. Like don't just think North America. Think, let's go English speaking and then we'll worry about translations, we'll worry about subtitles, we'll worry about stuff like that. Okay. Any questions on that? I know that stuff's, that's the tricky, this is the tricky part. None? Okay, cool. Where to sell your movies? Um, there's three things, festival markets and in person. A lot of us love the festival talk. Uh, the atmosphere is great there. It's all about the movies, it's about the, the performances, it's all about the creativity. So it just creates a good atmosphere for, for, for people. Acqui the acquisitions people are excited. They want to talk to filmmakers. Filmmakers want to talk to acquisitions people. Accolades, if a, if a distributor sees your film go up and be nominated for best documentary of the festival at Sundance, at Tribeca, even smaller ones, they're gonna pay attention and they're gonna be like, who's that person? What's that film about? And that's already something that you can put in your back pocket and pull out when you get to the negotiating table. So accolades are great, especially if they see you nominated or win. Make sure that you're uh, present to your acceptance speech is like, thank you for coming, you know, can I have all the distributors in the audience stand up please? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, it also gives you some negotiating time in person. It's always, festivals are always the greatest concentration of the film industries uh, in this sense, that you will never have more access to acquisitions people in any other place, okay? 
So when you go and you bump into somebody, or they come up to you after they see your screening, because that's all they're doing all week. I've done it, is just watch movies. It's crazy. At first, you're like, oh, that sounds awesome. But you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. This is what, oh, it's day one. Oh, you know? <laughs> but um, that's the cool thing is that you could meet them on a Monday, and they're there for another week and a half. And they're like, I saw your film. Oh, what would you think? I loved it. You want to grab coffee tomorrow? Yeah, totally. You meet. You talk. They like you. You like them. You want to have a meeting on the weekend? You can talk to your boss. You can talk to the exec. You know, you can talk to the you know, sales guys, you know, like T-Bot, S-Bot, A-Bot, you know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> and then you can, uh, you, but you have a whole week with this acquisitions person, you know, to bump into them, to talk to them, to get to know them. That's a lot of face time, and that's awesome. It also helps your negotiating time. You know, if, if you get into a proposal and you're like, I got to call my producer, or I got to talk to my producer, he's, you know, partying it up with Quentin Tarantino, so I got to go find him and then I'll come back to you. He, they're not going to disappear. You can meet up with them tomorrow or later that day. So festivals, super awesome place. A lot of fun. Markets, super awesome place, not as fun. Um, anybody? Oh, I, sorry. I meant to involve you guys. What are your favorite like film festivals out here? Anybody have any favorite film festivals? No? South what? South by Southwest. Southwest. Tribeca? Yeah, Tribeca. I just got into Cine. Okay. Oh, congrats. Congrats, man. Congrats. Urban World. Urban World? Where's that? In New York. Sorry, I just moved here. So. <laughs> um, Dude, Fantastic Fest was dream. Yo, Fantastic Fest. It's a dream. It's on my bucket list. Anybody here heard of Fantastic Fest? Talk about an awesome place to go with your film. It's very genre-based, like horror and sci-fi and fun stuff. I mean, it's got to be an acquisitions person, like, dream. Just like, ah, oh, aliens, zombies. <laughs> Vampires, yeah. Really? Films exclu like exclusively based on drone work? Really? That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. This is my drone. Cool. That's awesome, guys. Cool. Um, go. Even if you don't have a film, if you can swing it, swing a couple days off, and you can get out there, or just plenty, like you said. Urban Fest? Urban World. Urban World. Go out there, chill out, meet acquisitions people, meet salespeople, meet whoever. Commiserate, as they say. Anybody here of any markets? Anybody know any markets? The Cannes Film Festival is like, that's the largest one, correct? Cannes, yeah, Cannes like the big, is like the big film festival. It's like overshadowed because of like the, fe the festival itself. But Cannes, you're right. Uh, it is MIPCOM that's held in Cannes that's like the big market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the North American uh, television, and yeah, it goes on and on. They're always long names. NAPTI is the other one that uh, is in North America, and that usually handles like North America and Latin America. But anyway, think more of science convention. There's a lot of booths. There's a lot of advertisements. There's a lot of networking going on. It's a little more sterile than film festivals. Um, it's a competitive environment, so just go in with the idea. If you do ever go to a market, it's great for filmmakers to experience at least one. It's a lot less like, hey, what's up? How's it going? My name's Nick. You know, what's your name? What do you do? Don't care. Okay. <laughs> no, the idea is that it's much more competitive. They want you to, if you're going to approach their booth, you better have a pitch ready. You better have a log line ready. You better have a piece of paper that says something about your film on it. Because this isn't just like, let's grab drinks over there at, you know, the bar and hang out and look for celebrities. This is like, I'm here to work, I gotta acquire X amount of films, or I gotta sell X amount of films. This is very business oriented. A lot of distributors are there are to connect with other platforms, okay? So if you're a little filmmaker fish swimming in that pond, you better have a big bite. Um, we were talking earlier, who, who had it, about funding, about coming in, distributors coming in. I would say this more than anything is where a distributor would get involved you know, if you walk up to a booth and you're like, hey, my name is Nick. I am working on my third film. It has Jake Gyllenhaal in it. And we just need, um, we're looking for a buyer for the end of the film. You know, we want to get it pre-sold. They're much more like in the business mode of like, oh, let me run some numbers. Jake Gyllenhaal, you said? You know, so it's like, that is where I would kind of pitch the opportunity for funding. And that is actually where I saw a lot of filmmakers doing this. 
I did not. It's a documentary that Alec Baldwin and Jeffrey Tobin did. Uh huh. Jeffrey Tobin's really shitty, but there's a whole section in the documentary where they're at the market and they're trying to get funding for the film they're doing. Yep. But nobody wants to give them funding because like they want bigger names inside the movie. Yeah. Yeah, so that, it's a good movie. what is it called again? Seduced and Abandoned. It's actually a really good movie about Cam and cool. film Cool. Seduced and Abandoned. Yeah, awesome. Go watch that movie. It's on HBO? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Watch that and you'll know what this is. You don't even need this slide. <laughs> All right. Cool. So that's markets. And then the old fashioned way. This is the way a lot of us have to do it for our first film or two films. Is you got to get out there. You got to pound the pavement. You got to find them where they are. You got to go knock on their door. A lot of film submissions happen online over the phone, or you have a connection. Maybe you have somebody who works at a distribution company, or you, you, you know, go check LinkedIn. Oh, I'm one away. Awesome. Uh, do it. Do it that way. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Once you contact somebody there, they're just going to want to know about your film. They're going to want to see the film. Make sure that you have your, your link up there. And I usually recommend Vimeo because it has the best quality uh, and, and best buffers. So I usually recommend Vimeo, have a link and have it password protected and just have that ready to go as soon as they ask for it. You can include it in your introductory email, but um, word to the wise, this is where I would be a little more cautious with just flinging stuff out there. You know what I mean? Like I, I would want you guys to interact with the, with the company first, read kind of who they are if you can and then give them a screener when they request it because then it's all in your email chain, it's all proof, it's all a little more legit. So um, I usually hold that back until it's like, oh cool, yeah, yeah, we, we like your synopsis, we saw your trailer, include the trailer, no problem with that. We like your trailer, send us a link, dot, dot, dot. Um, and then get a meeting. In person is important because you're gonna get a feel for who you will be working with, they're gonna get a feel for you, they're gonna be like, whoa, this filmmaker, is informed and creative and hardworking. I love this. Cool. But sometimes you can go straight to hard work or straight to getting a meeting. Uh, I, you know, worked in the LA office. I was out there a couple times uh, for Gravitas Ventures, and filmmakers would just kind of like come in because they had an appointment with the acquisitions team, and they just met and talked, and they weren't even doing business yet. They were just meeting. So. Definitely opportunity there. It's a little harder in New York. Like El Segundo, California, it's way like, just like, yeah, man, come on in. In New York, you got the security guard. He's like, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I'm delivering this piece of mail. <laughs> you know? It's like spam mail from like a bank that I don't <laughs> work with. Uh, I'm delivering this. Um, so yeah, so yeah, guys, uh, old fashioned way, still works, especially with indie. Somehow it's like more romantic if you're an indie filmmaker doing this kind of stuff. So those are the three ways, festivals, markets, and the old fashioned way, okay? So now I'm gonna wrap it up with the big points. Um, and is everyone cool, everyone, everyone have questions? I know it's a lot of information I'm throwing at you guys. I'm sorry that I'm the old crotchety professor in the wool jacket now who's like, you know, just a couple more slides. 50 slides later, you're like, oh my God, where's the cafe? Like, <laughs> All right, cool. Um, but this is a, I know I think everything in this presentation is important, <laughs> but this to me is the thing that was like the most interesting to learn about uh, working in distribution as a filmmaker. What's actually that thing that they're gonna slide across the table to you when they're like, we'd love to do business with you? What's it gonna look like? What's gonna be the things that you should immediately look for, okay? Number one thing is you're gonna to look to see if there's a money guarantee. They often refer to this as the MG. This is like their cool thing, like, oh yeah, man, I just met this filmmaker the other day, threw him an MG, you know, it's like, <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> but it's a money guarantee. It's a precursory buy-in to the distribution of the film. If I'm the distributor and all you guys worked on the same movie <laughs> and we're all at the same table together at Sundance <laughs> and I slide the piece of paper over to you, that MG is saying, hey, I like your movie. I know all these other people here at Sundance want your movie, but I'm willing to pay you this amount of money for you to work with me. Okay? That's, this is everybody's dream. This is the golden goose. And it's possible. It can happen for you. It can happen for a lot of other great independent filmmakers. This is interesting because 
it varies so much from film to film, from festival to festival, from scenario to scenario. I was reading that like the biggest acquisition at Sundance, well, no, the average fest, uh, Sundance acquisition now is like between five and seven million for like big films. That's a lot of money, but those are films that have cast and a lot of cool stuff and bells and whistles and yada yada. Sundance isn't even Sundance anymore, so <laughs> go ahead. Get into it. You're, you're smart, man. You should be doing this. <laughs> um, the money guarantee is basically saying, here, this is yours. Congratulations on an amazing film. We want to work with you. And it's yours. And then you got to go back to your team and divide it up how you want to. What happens after that is you're going to talk about the rev share. And this is the other key point. It's any money made is split. So anytime you go into business with a distribution company and they start putting your film out into the world and it starts making money, you're going to start distributing or you're going to start splitting that money. It's not like the distributor's like, hey, we just want to represent you because we like you. you know? like they're going to take a cut, and it's going to be a percentage of whatever you make. And that's going to be detailed in your contract in the deal. And I uh, usually see it around the 25% mark. Okay, So if you see that, don't freak out. 30%, don't freak out. If it's like 50-50, uh, no way. Uh, not, not, I wouldn't do that. Um, but the idea is that this is going to take care of anything that the film starts to generate after you start getting it out into the world, OK? Here is a little, little tidbit. You're not always going to get this. But you're always going to have this if they're giving you a deal. You're always going to have a rev share. You're always going to talk about how you're going to split the money that the film makes. So even if you don't get an MG, if you got no offers for an MG from any distributor, don't feel like the day is lost. Don't feel like you're not a success. Don't feel like you can't do anything. We've seen plenty of great films who have just done revenue share, who have done amazing for the filmmakers. And, that the, and then what that does is the distributor is much more interested. Next time you make a movie, they might be like, all right, you deserve the MG. Or you might be like, hey, if you don't give us the MG, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't do business with you. you know? Look what we did just on rev share alone. Okay. But you always have this. You might not always have this, but you always have this. Last thing, marketing spend. This is the funds that will be put towards promoting the film. Unfortunately, you're not always going to have this either. But there are deals where a filmmaker or a distribution company will say, we're going to give you X amount of money, the MG. We want to work with you. Cool. We're going to split it 25%, 75%. Cool. Awesome. And we're going to give you. A lot, we're going like, to say we're going to kick in X amount of dollars to make sure that the film is also marketed. Okay? If this isn't in there, they're still going to do some work marketing it, but it's going to be a lot more grassroots stuff. It's going to be a lot more like low margin stuff. It's going to be a lot. Not that they don't care. It's just they can't always spread their energies all over. When I was working at Gravitas, there was 15 people working there. And three of them were in the marketing department. And they were handling, they were working on distributing like over, uh, like close to 100 new films digitally every year. Three people, like that's like 33 films a year. Like that's insane to try to market every single one. Go ahead. So, right, so aren't they shooting themselves in the foot by not having the marketing? What was that? I, you said there's a, there's a volume of films, but aren't they shooting themselves in the foot for not having the marketing budget? So, the, it, the, the point was that distributors are kind of shooting themselves in the foot by not marketing. That's true. Some films are not going to get the leverage as other films. But that, those distribution companies don't not market any films. You know what I'm saying? They, they have their kind of like their prize films, and then they have their films that they like, they want to help, but they just can't devote the manpower or the money is towards. So, but they can say, hey, we can like help you out with this campaign or we have this connection over here, and they will support you in that way. But it, like I said, it's going to be a lot more grassroots. Um, usually with a marketing spend, they're going to hire an outside agency that's going to be monitored by the marketing department. Uh, unless it's a bigger company that's going to handle all their marketing in-house, if it's a pure indie distributor, that money is going to go to paying an advertising firm. Okay. So these are the three things you're going to look for right away to understand. Yes, in the back. So that's a great point. Um, sometimes the point was that if there's a marketing spend, basically the revenue share doesn't kick in until this money is recouped. 
So the idea is that they're saying, we're going to spend this amount of money, and until we make this back, we're taking 100% of the profits. That's true. Sometimes that happens. And you know what? That's seen, in, some, in a lot of cases, that's a fair deal. Especially if they're saying, you're an independent filmmaker, this is your first film, but we like it so much, we're going to put down some money, but to, to guard our rear ends, we're going to wait to recoup this. But to really make sure that we're honest with the deal, we're going to give you an MG. That to me is a deal that sounds really great. Because if you believe in your film, and they believe in your film, it's going to be no time before this is made back. So yeah, great point though, great point. To that point, these interact in different ways, and they're constructed in different ways. So that's why you've got to be informed and on top of it, and you've got to be thinking of film as a business to talk about this stuff. OK? Any other questions? Those are great questions, great points. No? Cool. Other details, uh, are they going to include a theatrical? Some independent companies, like I work for Gravitas, a lot of times they were only going to run the films digitally. There's going to be no theatrical involved. If you're holding out for a theatrical, but a distribution company doesn't want to give it to you, it's OK. Just keep your theatrical rights and try to find somebody else. Because their, di their digital might be super strong, but they just don't want to do a theatrical. It's OK. Like I said, I'm repeating myself, but just make it sink in. Keep your theatrical and go find somebody else, or see if you can get it in theaters on your own. You know? That's a detail that's going to be cleared in the, in the deal memo. Length of contract is an important detail to note. The average is like five to seven years. If you see that, good. If you see 10 years, it's still OK. People aren't, uh, companies aren't typically going to try to lock up your film for like 20 years because that's like a huge risk. You know, it's just like in their fold and they're not doing anything or, or what have you. That's just a lot of responsibility for 20 years. So five to seven years is pretty good. Um, they're going to talk about the rights and territories, all the ones we talked about before. They're going to kind of maybe carve out certain ones. They're going to want, I want North American, um, and I want Europe, but I don't need the rest of the world. Or they're going to be like, we want worldwide, and we want all your rights. That's OK. Just make sure that they have a plan for all those rights and all those territories. OK? And the last couple ones, delivery. Who's responsible for payment? So when your, your hard drive with your film goes to the lab to encode, encode it to go to Netflix, who's going to pay for that fee? It should be the distributor. I mean, there, for me, there's like no reason to think that the filmmaker should be responsible for this fee, OK? It's something the distributor takes on when they sign your film. It's something they take on when they get into their part of the business. So make sure that's clearly, explicitly stated that they're responsible for deliverable fees, OK? There's usually a note in there that says, like, if you're going to do languages, a lot of times any filmmakers might have to go halvesies on like getting a language, OK? Payment, um, how often and uh, how you get paid is also going to be in there. So that's the deal. Um, it comes you know, in a couple pages of a white sheet, and it has a lot of like lawyer lingo. Don't be afraid of it. Just look for the keywords. Look for the, the details. Obviously, you can have a lawyer look over it. It's a good idea. Or have somebody in your group who's like more business oriented read over it. Um, but if you're in a meeting and you just want to look at it and you know these key words, you can at least start to give the distributor a feeling back of like, hey, this deal looks good to us. Like, I would be cool with this, you know, stuff like that. So that's it. I'm wrapping it up. Why is indie, uh, indie distribution important? For us filmmakers, I think really truly believe now more than ever we have the opportunity to make a living as independent filmmakers. Um, a lot of us put pressure on ourselves like we got to make that one awesome film that'll set us up and we'll be good to go. But really, if you're diligent and you know your route and you know how to deal with what we all talked about right now, you can set yourself up to just make you know, a film a year, two films a year, a documentary here and there, and those films can give back to you and start creating that income that you need to just be a person. <laughs> and this can be your occupation. Uh, independent distribution, very much a stepping stone, productive enterprise that leads to greater opportunities. If people see that you treat your film like a business and you're out there and it's successful to even a moderate extent and that it's organized and your efforts are on point, that's going to lead to the next round being really just like on the money and they're going to be much more interested in getting the next project. I know filmmakers, when I worked there, they were on their third film that Gravitas had acquired. 
you know, and Gravitas had each of their films. Every time, a little more, Gravitas like gave, you know, a little more, invested a little more. Um, and then visibility, now more than ever, we talked about big screens back in the day. I, can, I can't imagine, unfortunately, because it might be cool, but like a world where all I think about is getting a film on the big screen, you know? That, and that was filmmakers a while ago. That was all they thought about. Now, and I come from a traditional background where I'm like, theater only, no Netflix, no nothing, you know? Now I'm like, get it out there. Get it to as many eyeballs as you can. Make sure your film is out there. Make sure visibility is high. And if you take this like indie distribution kind of like idea and take it and run with it, your visibility is going to be way up there. And then for the industry, for me, I'm so happy to see um, companies being honest with their filmmakers. I'm so happy to see filmmakers who are informed and hardworking and just being super creative with the way they're exposed. I saw, <laughs> I saw um, an indie film had gone around Brooklyn and had like put those really hard to get off stickers on like light posts for just blocks. And it was just their film and the title and where they could watch it and where you could watch it. And I'm like, that's super gorilla, but that's super cool because it's just out here, you know? And I thought that was a really modern way of, of treating um, indie distribution and exposure. But for the industry, it's gonna, you know, all these new voices and all this new way of seeing independent content it's going to develop more creative content and creative engagement with audiences. Audiences have more access to creators now than ever before, and that's great for filmmakers because really all we strive for is to have that audience and to interact with people. So it's going to be awesome. Distributors love seeing filmmakers who talk and do panels and do ask me anything on Reddit and blah, 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 all that cool mushy-gushy fan stuff. Um, and then finally, it's going to lead to new horizons. Like I talked about earlier, the movie pass, that to me is so cool. I mean, to make it affordable again, to go see like movies up on the big screen for mass groups of people, I just, I'm appreciative of that. But what it's going to do is it's also going to enable independent filmmakers to get their films in that space, offer fresh perspectives, fresh way, ways of reaching the audience, new experiences with film. And that to me, is just like the most important part of indie distribution. So um, that about wraps it up. Uh, the wrap up, I'm just missing it, but basically we were just talking about in the beginning, it's uh, after life of the film and it's, oh, that's what I did. I didn't, I put an animation on it. I was trying to be all cool, trying to be creative, you know. Um, the life of a film, remember the afterlife, just think afterlife, 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 from that moment you have the idea to the moment that you're done and you say that's a wrap, to the moment that you say cut and print, to the moment that you say it's it, I'm done. I don't want to see this film ever again. Uh, you don't have to watch it, but you have to work with it. Um, the life of a film, afterlife. Film is a business, not a product. Don't dump your creativity just so that you're like, oh, I'm going to be all Mr. MBA or Miss you know, businesswoman, you don't have to dump your creative self to be this. You just have to start trying to think more in a business sense so that you can relate to distributors when you talk to them. And then be the right kind of filmmakers, be informed, be creative, and be hardworking because distributors will appreciate that and they will respond to you much better. We talked about the distributor, the, structu the structure of the distribution company, um, you know, just Whoever you meet who works at a distribution company, just be cool with them, and they're going to be able to hook you up, you know? Um, but acquisitions are the people you always want to target. Those are like, you're in acquisitions? You're my best friend for the week. Um, business first, taste making second. Just remember that they are business people that like movies, and they like working with movies. But at the end of the day, they have to bring home the bacon for their uh, employees and their coworkers and for their families, and this is just kind of the business they choose to work in. Um, and then their shopping list. There's a lot in there, but I just wrote down the ones that I really think are super, super, super important. Cash genre and merchandising, those are where you can really shine in success and in creativity. Uh, we talked about selling. Remember TVOD, SVOD, AVOD, all the other ones are pretty self-explanatory, but these are the new ones. Anybody remember what this one is? 
Transactional, close, theatrical, it does begin with a T. It's a tricky one. I thought it was, I thought it was TV for the longest time. t -bon. television, video on demand. <laughs> yeah. Televideo, video on demand. No, it's, uh, it's transactional. Anybody remember what SVOD is? No, close. Subscription, subscription on demand. AVOD? Advertising. Advertising, yep, just remember those three. Those are the new key buzzwords. If you know those, you're gonna impress a lot of distributors, just saying. Um, Territories, remember there's a lot of them out there. Not all of them are worth it, but uh, it's always smart to be creative and thoughtful about who your audience might be um, or what's going on. If your distributor comes up to you after you've been working with them for a little while and they're like, man, your, your film's just blown up in the Philippines, just start like tweeting at the Philippines. Just like be like, you know, hashtag Philippines, like be sure to catch my film, you know, it's on sale or do a special in the Philippines or do what you can to support that market, you know? Uh, because that, that will help you get known um, around the world, um, which is kind of cool thought. You know, you can be an independent filmmaker known around the world. Isn't that cool? People, people halfway around the world can see your movie, uh, which wasn't always the case. And then just remember the deal, the, uh, the money. You're going to talk MG, rev share, and marketing spend. Those are the three key points. Make sure you talk about those with your team, your producers. Um, the theatrical, whether they're going to have one or not, and how to make it work if your main distributor doesn't want to do one. Rights and territories, make sure that's clearly and explicitly stated. Oh, real quick note here. They might be like, we're just gonna go North America and England or Europe, and then they're gonna be like, you know, we met with a couple people, they saw your film on our catalog just in passing and they wanted it, they happened to be from Australia. Uh, can we add that? And if you're like, yeah, I'm not working with anybody else in Australia, they'll modify the contract and they'll t pick up Australia. So this is flexible. The rights and territories aspect is a flexible part of the contract. Um, and then finally, make sure payment and delivery is clearly stated. Uh, who's paying for what and then when you're going to get paid so that you can track to make sure that they're paying you on time and fairly. So that's it. Um, all of these notes can be found on lightbulbgrip.com. Uh, uh, also, I have all my business cards on me. Come grab one, shoot me an email, have a phone call. You know, we can talk more about it later, um, more in depth, and get, even get into the strategy portion of things. Um, also, I'll make sure that it's like posted on, uh, my contact information is posted on lightbulbgrip.com. But uh, you can also go to nickroyak.com and you can just uh, message me there. That's my little plug for my cool new baby website. But anyway, we're going to do some Q&A right now, and Adam's going to come up and uh, bop around with me. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Can we get a round of applause for Nick? <laughs> Sorry that it was like, I know it's so long. I know this stuff is like, ugh. Like, you know, we want to talk about plot lines. We want to talk about character development. The artsy stuff. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, this can, get, this can get cool when you see your film starting to like take off and succeed. So. How many of you guys picked up a new skill that you guys didn't know you had? Or, or, for, or picked up a new skill today that um, is new to you guys? Anybody? Yeah, a couple hands. New information, okay. New information. Wonderful. <laughs> new information, yeah. Okay, I, got, I know I got a million questions. Um, let's start with the audience, though. Do you guys have anything that you're left with that you want to know more about? I was curious about um, uh, Redbox. Where does that fit in? Yeah. So where does where's the red box model fit into this? So the red box model is in the physical um, rights category. So uh, they pretty much have relationships with distributors. They acquire the rights uh, to distribute the film in a physical format, which is DVDs. But they don't actually acquire films themselves. Gotcha. They get the rights. They get the basically. They don't even. I don't think even print. Well, they might print their DVDs. I'm Probably sure. for sheer volume, yeah. Yeah, but they they uh, they definitely get the rights, so they're not they don't make. Distributor would sell to them. They don't make their own acquisitions. Gotcha. They're just uh, the platform, so to speak, the physical platform. So, like, if you made a deal with Netflix, and Netflix, I don't know if any of you guys remember, still does it has a DVD offer. Um, yeah. You, if you make a deal with them, you might make a separate deal for the physical there and the. The SVOD, the subscri subscription? Yeah, so that's where you got, things can get sticky. You want to make sure that if, because uh, now Netflix is sometimes acting as a distributor, so it can get tricky. Because, but really all they want is your SVOD rights, because they don't have a transactional platform. 
So that leaves transactional up, that leaves ad up, that leaves television up, that leaves uh, theatrical up in some cases. So if Netflix came to you and said, we want your movie for TVA, or for SVOD, uh, and we also want your DVD rights, you're going to want to make sure you have those there, or that you know that they have them there. If they want them exclusively, a distributor who wants them later on is not going to be able to uh, acquire them. So you just need to be careful. You need to read through that paperwork. Uh, that doesn't mean that Netflix would be like, we just want the DVD rights, not exclusive. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, that just means it's more for Netflix to work with. So they're going to take it and they're going to have it, but I'm also going to make sure that physical can go to Redbox. It can go to small uh, video rental chains and stuff like that. So, or it can just go on sale on our website. So might you partner with a second distribution firm to handle all the, the theater and AVOD and all the yeah. other ones that Netflix isn't? Yes. So ideally, you want to find a distributor that can have a plan from point A to point B with your film. Um, I, I would never recommend somebody just piecemealing it. Like, TVOD went to ne or SVOD went to Netflix, and then TVOD went to this guy, and SVOD went, or uh, AVOD went to this guy, and TV went to this guy. You want to make sure, you want to try to find a distributor who can like umbrella everything. Maybe they have a great relationship with Netflix and they're they'll like. They'll do the conversations. They'll just, yeah, they'll yeah. just, they'll, they'll be like, we're going to do Netflix, but we're going to do it after we do uh, the transactional on Amazon Prime. And then we're going to do physical after that. And we'll just like make sure Netflix gets our physical as well as Redbox. And we're also going to have a store because, uh, like an online store. That unbranded um, example I talked to you about, at Christmas time, they packaged like the DVD with like the coffee table book. So it's like it boosted everything together. But how it might be odd if you like gave them a cool coffee book and here's a code to redeem online for the movie. You know, they got to give them everything physically. So that's why physical is, is still uh, a thriving part of the market. Interesting. Will the distribution company have like, uh, a, set, like a schedule in place or would it be a distribution company? We're first going to be doing the transactional for seven months or a year or something like that, and then we're going to transition into the SVOD for months or something. And like, because you obviously can't, you don't want them all in one place. Because right. So is the is the distribution company going to give you the schedule? Yeah. Like, Sorry. I'm just repeating the questions, guys, just you know, because we're we're recording this. But yeah. Is that um, what it's going to like work out to essentially? Is this also is this where the t you use the term windowing a couple times? Yes. So can we? So windowing, I didn't put it in here because it's a very like, complex um, part of the distribution process. That's like one of those more in-depth strategy conversations that we could have. But windowing is basically that. When, when they revert, refer to that plan, it's windowing. And it's exactly right that we're going to start with the theatrical run. And then we're going to move to digital. And we're going to move to digital in this way. And then we're going to try to revamp everything by getting it on TV channels and stuff like that. So, they should have a plan, and when you work with a distributor, ask for that. Ask for what's your windowing plan. And if they're like, oh, we'll take care of it, don't worry about it, be like, no, I'd like to see it. I want to know. I need to support how that's going to go through my efforts because I'm going to be tweeting, I'm going to be Instagramming, I'm going to be doing panels with my crew, we're going to be doing stuff, and I want to be able to tell them, hey, this week it's going to be on Netflix, go watch it. Hey, this week it's going on Amazon Prime, go watch it. So yeah, definitely make sure that whenever you talk to a distributor, they're telling you their windowing plan. So yeah, definitely keep that in mind too as you go. Um, so with film festivals, you know, there's, all, there's different tiers, right? There's different levels, mm -hmm. you know, low, medium, whatever. And we all, we all know like the top few, you know, Toronto, Toronto, whatever. Yeah. So if you get awards and nominations from lower ones, that, and you, is that a good strategy to kind of build? Or is it better to just try to go as high as you can realistically? Like, yeah. So with the different tiers of film festivals, is it better to start with a lot of little um, lower tier festivals, or is it better to flash and bang and start right at the top? So uh, I always recommend that you go for the biggest one that you can. Even if it's like, you know what, I'm going to submit to one like Sundance, one like Tribeca, just to try. You know, I think my film's worth it, and it's going to go. But I would, I would say that it's not necessarily a good idea to work from the bottom up. Because a lot of the big film festivals want exclusive premiere. Basically, a lot of people know what that is. It's just that we want first run, and if you've already screened somewhere else at a different festival, we don't want your film. Now, in the back room, sometimes it's like, well, this movie's really good, and that was a small festival, so yeah, we want it. 
But usually it's like they want the premiere, and, they, and, they, and especially if it has cast, they want the premiere. So that's why you kind of got to mediate your risk by going big first. And if it doesn't really work out on your first couple ones, then it's fine to just start going and blazing because at that point you want the biggest spread. And if you know that you can win certain festivals, that's awesome too because you can get the little laurels and you can put that on the poster and that looks good for your distributor and for your audience. So yeah, that's a good question though in terms of uh, distribution, how to, how to kind of handle the festival circuit. Yeah. The coordinators talk to the coordinators? Well, you mean you fe mine, festival like, coordinators? Yeah, like yeah if you have a connection, for sure. Or when I was submitting to mine, I would just reach out to the coordinator and let them know I submitted, thank them for the opportunity, and then usually nine times out of ten, they'll hit you back because they like filmmakers. Yeah. For the most part. That's a great point. That's a great point. Film festivals want great films, and I know everyone here is definitely capable of making amazing movies. So I would say the one thing I do caution is like, I guess don't treat a festival as part of, like an essential part of the distribution process. Basically I don't want you to contaminate it with like too strict of business thinking. Like I have to get in and I have to meet an acquisitions person. Sometimes acquisitions happen way after you premiere at a, at a larger festival. But they just see like, oh this was, a, this was three days I wasn't at the festival, so that's why I didn't see your film. But you played at Sundance, that's amazing. Or you played at Tribeca. Or you played at a couple medium you know, level ones on both coasts. That's cool. So that's definitely good. But use festivals first and foremost as a way of just enjoying the process, enjoying other filmmakers, and then being on the lookout for opportunities as they come. Does that make sense? Because I, I know some people get really stressed about uh, festivals and premiering at festivals, and it's just, it's unfair to themselves and it's unfair to the film, so. It's your only time to drink champagne in this whole process. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Toast as many times as you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve. I was wondering if uh, you ever seen like a real, just a bad distribution deal, like a cringy one where it's, you saw someone offer and someone took it and then you're like, oh, you probably shouldn't have took that result. Oh, tell us a story about a yeah. cringy or a bad yeah. distribution deal. Um. <laughs> well, all Africa and there's certain companies that you want to avoid in the business. Um, and Worrying for Gravitas was awesome because they put in a lot of effort wherever they could to uh, support a lot of very low budget films. Um, but there are certain companies that I won't mention the name of that would sign somebody and then they would just disappear and they wouldn't do any work. And the film might go up on like iTunes, but it's... it's sign them up to shut them down, basically? Yeah, yeah, in a way. Yeah. Competitively, yeah. Oh, not, not, not competitively, not competitively. They just, they just lacked the effort to do it. So it's like they had the ability to turn it on on iTunes and get it out there in the world, but they didn't do anything to push the film. They didn't promote it. They didn't leverage their connections that they said that they had. So what would they get out of that? What is, yeah, what does the distributor get out of that? To be honest with you, they don't get anything. They're just bad business practices. So it's like, it's like a distribution company that you don't want to work with, not because they're just stealing your film and benefiting, it's just they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. So and on, the, on the other end of things, I do want to say this, I've seen filmmakers get their film at a distribution company and then they not do anything and then the film goes nowhere. So just keep that in the mind. The filmmaker not doing anything. The filmmaker's not involved anymore. And they're just like, you know what, I delivered it, it's cool, it's with a distribution company, awesome, rev share, magic, hocus pocus, boom. <laughs> let Jesus take the wheel. Yeah, yeah, but it just, yeah, it didn't work out that day. But uh, the point is just that distributors, once they start to get the sense that the filmmakers are just like off in La La Land, they're not gonna like, why would I go to bat for that person? Why would I put forth the extra effort? But if they see filmmakers for a film that are just like going and working and supporting and being positive and tweeting and getting a cast involved, then when they go to that meeting to Netflix, and Netflix is like, Eh, we just kind of want to cut that one. No, you're taking that film. You're taking that film as part of this package. They're going to go to bat for you, and they're going to they're going to support you. So, it's like twofold. It can be either circumstance: the distributor doesn't show up, be informed, or the filmmaker doesn't show up, be hardworking. And the funny thing is, is a lot of times filmmakers will br blame the distribution company at that point. <laughs> They'll be like, "You didn't do all this stuff." It's like, you didn't do anything. <laughs> like you, you didn't. You didn't show up when we wanted you to show up. You didn't 
make this appearance, you didn't tweet this stuff, you didn't do the, you know, just the simple grassroots marketing things that we asked you to do. So not all the blame is on us. Yeah, so that's a good question though. Next question. One there. So oh. Let's say you have like a distribution deal and like the partnership isn't working out the way you want it to. How do you get your rights back? That's Ooh, deal doesn't work out the way you want it to. How do you claw your rights back? So to recall your rights would require legal action and it would require grounds that the distribution company is not doing what they said that they would do in your agreement. So you would definitely need a, a full-time lawyer on the job and you would definitely need to have a good reason to prove you know, that the distributor was not doing what they said that they would do. So it would require legal action is pretty much the sum of it. Something that we haven't, um we didn't mention it at all. In this process, normally when you're signing contracts and stuff, you want to have a lawyer in the room. Um, yeah. Is what point do you bring a lawyer into the discussion? Um, is there a particular kind of lawyer you want to go for? Uh, you definitely want an entertainment lawyer. I mean, you definitely want, you don't want to just <laughs> ask old, you know, Aunt Matilda who does like, you know, geriatric claims and stuff like that, yeah, real estate claims. You want somebody who knows how it's going to work, um, what a, a deal looks like in the business. You know, you want somebody who's seen contracts before and can just be like, okay, yeah, this is good, this is good. Or, you know, glare, 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 red tape, red tape, red tape. So um, you definitely want to try to find entertainment lawyers and, you know, if you can, honest entertainment lawyers. Uh, I know there's a lot of good ones out there, but you want to be careful. Um, the other thing is, you don't have to take your lawyer to the film festival with you. Like, come on, little lawyer, <laughs> let's go to the screening. You know, you don't have to do that. You can just make sure that, you know, you get the copy of the contract and you immediately say, awesome, I'm going to send this over to my people and ship it away right away. i get back to you tomorrow. Is that cool? They're going to be expecting that. Send it away. Don't have to pull them out of their office with you to the festival or to the market or wherever. Just have them on call and say, I'm going to be at the festival. You know, so can you like, if, if I send you something at 12 o'clock at night, please look at it. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say is, yeah. uh, so you know, the contract phase is really like the, the moment that you would really need one. Okay, so, so don't sign a contract in the meeting. You Definitely make don't sure sign a contract home. in the meeting. Don't, I mean, even, even if it's the most perfect deal in the world and you know it, even if you've like made five films and this is a great deal and this is the one that's gonna make you go, like, don't give the distributor the satisfaction. <laughs> just be like, oh, cool, cool. I'm gonna yeah. go, oh my God. Like, you know, just do one of those, you know, like just walk away, give it a moment, and, and then, then go in, okay? And so never sign in the meeting, um, unless you do for some reason have your lawyer there, or you are working with a partner who has background in law, entertainment law, or something like that. Sometimes producers do, um, and you trust them, then you can do it if you really wanted to. Yeah. But I would never sign one right there, right then and there. You get you your you take it back to your lawyer, and he finds something on page seven, paragraph four. Yeah. Wait a minute, and you're, yeah, 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 and then yeah. you're glad you did. You then, the, then your dog is gone the next day. <laughs> the distributor's <laughs> walking around with it at the <laughs> festival, like, wait, it's what? It's Sparky. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. Go okay. Back. So how do you find an entertainment lawyer and at what point in the process do you need to bring, it, before distribution, yeah. do you need to start attaching one? Um, if you're just an independent producer so you don't have a production company and it's just kind of like you, I would say you probably want to have um, a lawyer early on in the process of pre-production just because you're also gonna wanna have like production insurance, you're gonna wanna have like certain paperwork done where hey like, I am the owner of the film at the end of the day, so this is the contract that I signed, or you know, the director of photography is gonna sign a contract. So there's paperwork up front. So it's like early on in the process that you would look for that lawyer. As a producer, that's probably what you're gonna wanna do. And then, I'm not sure exactly how it works, probably a retainer fee that you're gonna pay, just like to have them on call for different things. Because like you asked earlier about getting your rights back, that's more like having a lawyer on call 
for like a long period of time every day. Oh, they said this today. Oh, they're coming in with this. That's like a very day-to-day -day process with a lawyer. Otherwise, I feel like you really just need somebody to run things by and kind of have them on that retainer. So they'll probably like process those documents, generate those documents and stuff like that for you for a fee. Does yeah. that make sense? So normally the way I work with my business lawyer is that when we when he reviews contracts, he'll just give me a flat rate for it. And then every once in a while he'll call me and say, listen, this is a weird contract. This is going to be a longer thing. And then I'll work out a different set of numbers with him. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's just it, like general business stuff. Most lawyers will give you um, a review of what you're what they're going to sign up for before they do it. Exactly. Yep. Okay. For deliverables, do you require E and O insurance? For deliverables, do do you require errors and omissions insurance? Um, that's a good question. I I don't believe so. Uh, a lot of filmmakers just came in and kind of like just dropped it off, and like didn't have to do any paperwork, didn't really have to file anything. Um, I would say that is a specific question for the distributor you're working with, because okay. it might vary. So for those who don't know, errors and omissions insurance usually covers like lawyers and accountants yeah. in case they make a mistake on your taxes or they make a mistake in a contract. That's what covers them from being um, from from taking damage. So right. uh, if you make a mistake when you're submitting a film and you forget to include somebody and they chase, uh, or you forget to include an actor in the credits or something and they chase after you for it. Um, yeah. That's what that's for. Yeah. It's also for like fair use stuff sometimes. Yeah. Oh, there's a million places you use them. Just, yeah. yeah if in the case big you one that comes up with that, though, is usually music rights. It's just like make sure that you got that <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> like, no, you can't play like, you know, it was only eight Saturday seconds. Night Fever for like three different times in your film about dancing. <laughs> Unless you got permission, and then you're fine. But a lot of people don't even think that way. I want to steal the, um, the mic and ask one quick question. Sure. Um, so every once in a while on a film, when you're signing up for high-level positions, um, you'll hear the term uh, getting points on the back end, or getting a percentage uh -huh. of it. Where would you normally, in, in looking at whether that's uh, MG or um, uh, rev share, or where, where does those points usually fit in? How, how would that yeah. translate for me as a crew member or as yeah. a... So that, that is uh, definitely more of a production question um, because it, it has to do with the film before it's actually you know, created. But the idea is that, you're gonna, say you and I have an agreement that you know, we're gonna split 50-50. Anything, as far as I'm concerned, that deal says anything that we make in the distribution process, we're splitting 50-50. Okay. So the distributor would have nothing to do with that. Their rev share is only between the ownership of the film and themselves. So what the director's relationship is with the director of photography or producer to producer, the distributor has nothing to do with. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. I it's, just didn't know if you might know uh, heading into the, into the production side of the world. Yeah, no, no. I mean, yeah. but, but that's, that's how I would treat it is that if I was a producer and, and we were splitting funds of whatever we make on the film, it's whatever we get from the distributor through their efforts, we would be splitting so, between us on the agreed upon thing. Yes, yeah, so the money guarantee and the rev share kind of put together. Yeah, because as far as I'm concerned, the money guarantee and the rev share are all profits for the film. So the, the it's MG... It's one big pot. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, 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 any, it's everything kind of coming into the film. How that disperses back to... Because I know a lot of filmmakers, like, that's what we didn't talk about, but that's like a film financing discussion is I had a bunch of backers, and I don't actually make any money until they break even, and they recoup their costs. So it might be great. The distributor is making money. The film's making money. You're just not making money quite yet because you're trying to pay back the people who believed in your film and put down the cash for it. So that's all determined between the filmmakers, the distributor, and honestly, distributors don't want anything to do with it. I've seen that though. I've seen <laughs> filmmakers call and be like, I have a problem, you know, my producer is like telling me that I owe him so much money and the distributor's like, what? Like, I have nothing to do with your producer. <laughs> like, I, we pay you what we do, owe you. I'm still talking into my, my, <laughs> my pretend mouth. We pay you what you, uh, according to our agreement, and that's it's it. It's one check. It's it. Yeah, it's yeah. one check that goes out regularly, and that's it. They don't yeah. want to deal with anything. Honestly, we were talking about that, you know, stuff. Music rights come in. I've also seen that where a film was picked up on rev share, and then, like, all the music rights weren't cleared, and somehow they missed that. 
like the distributor missed that. And so the film couldn't even make money for anybody until they figured out what they were going to do about the music rights. And the distributor doesn't want to pay royalties for music rights. And the filmmaker is an independent filmmaker. How are they going to afford it? You see what I'm saying? So it just caused like a huge, huge problem in that regard. So just make sure your ducks are in a row. Make sure you have your stuff together. And don't bother your, with your distributor with that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they right, will not like you after that. <laughs> sure. uh, Yeah. Whose line is it anyway? Huh? Whose line is it anyway? No, no, no. no? Okay. Yeah, show. The Drew Carey show. Oh, the Drew <laughs> Carey show. It's like yeah. the Drew Carey show. <laughs> that show with Drew Carey. That was comedy. The Drew Carey show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that show. I've been looking for it, but you can't find it because of the music. There was something with uh, the music rights. They didn't get permission. So it's yeah. been, you know, years since that show's been out, but thousands. Yeah. Okay. So, so you can't find the it, yeah. Drew Carey show it's online like anymore because there's they don't have the music rights. Yeah. Because the music changed, I don't know if you remember the yeah. opening. So they probably had the rights for one section, but they didn't land the rights for yeah. resyndication afterwards. Yeah, oh, that is so much money down the drain. Yeah. So it was such an easy show to to just start putting out. Yeah. 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 But that kind of goes into goes into the idea of just making sure that your film is like a, a smooth running business before you get into that conversation with the distributor. Because nothing will scare a distributor away faster than having problems, telling them you have problems with your crew or with certain rights or with a part of your film or we're getting sued by a location because we did this. They're like, well, this is a mess. You we don't, don't have your ducks together. We don't yeah. want to be liable. We don't want anything to do with it. So just make sure that you're either really like cleaned up or you're just really quiet about it. Like, don't be like, I need this MG. Like, you know, like, they gonna be like, yeah, well, you're not getting it. <laughs> uh, so last month we had a discussion about leadership in film, and one of the things I talked about um, in being a department head was separating the, t the world above you and the world below you, mm -hmm. in that the, if you have problems in the, it, with the crew below you, never tell the producer about it, and if the director and producer are screaming fighting with each other, there's no reason that the yeah. crew below you needs to know about it. So in the same way, when you're working with the distributor, no matter what's happening on set, everything's fine, and um, yeah, because yeah. yeah. telling them about your problems gets you nothing. It yeah. doesn't help, yeah. Unless it's a success story about how you overcame something for the film. Marketing material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't really pertain to the conversation of distribution, okay? Next question. That's it? Oh, Steve? I don't know, sorry. Um, uh, typically, in like a written out deal, is that marketing fund have a cap on it? Or, the marketing or, spend? Or can it, those expenses can just keep going and you'll never see Yes, yes. So the question is like does the does the marketing spend have a cap on it or is it like infinity? It always has a cap on it. Sure. They're not going to they're not going to say every dime we spend on marketing from now until the end of time we're going to hold against the film. They're just saying that this initial guarantee of marketing spend is going to happen because we think it'll help all of us, but we're not going to be able to pay you until we recoup it. And that's the cap, boom, it's cut off. That's the agreed upon amount. Yes, yes. And that doesn't mean to say that the distributor won't spend more money after, but that money, you're probably, you're not gonna be liable for that at that point. That would be like saying, we have this film for another five years, we're two years in, it's still doing amazing, we wanna keep pushing it, we wanna do some merchandising for it because we found people really like the character in it. Push, 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 and all of a sudden, they're spending more marketing dollars but they, they can't hold that against you because it's not part of the, your initial agreement. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's coming out of their 25% for them to grow their own. Yeah, but like well. the merchandising agreement, say they were going to start merchandising it to market it, that would be like a whole other agreement like because you own the rights to the merch, sure. but they want to do that. So that's like a whole other thing. But if they're just spending marketing dollars, that's up to them. There's no situation where they can sort of package your film with other films trying to sell it to territories and use your marketing uh, expenses on other films? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, another okay. smart, smart question. Um, Wait, so what was, one more time. You're, so you're, so like somebody, so a distributor might package a film with other films and then spend your marketing dollars on all of them? Kind of yes. thing? Yes. Okay. Or so. on the strongest one of that package. Oh, yeah. on the strongest one. So yeah. it might, might be somebody else's film. Yeah, I guess that's what 
Yeah. So that does happen, first of all. Um, not often, though. So the way to like circumvent that and to avoid that, um, where your film is packaged with other ones and the marketing dollars that you were guaranteed is spent on other films in that package, um, to avoid that is just to like try to, to, to work with your lawyer and to come up with language in the marketing spend part that it would be spent specifically towards your film. And then if you found out that it wasn't, like they were doing something else like that, then that would be grounds to, you know, say, hey, that money you spent, either you got to, then you would have to like figure out something with your distributor at that point. You basically just get some serious language in there uh, to look at. Some specific yeah, language. Some you want it to be specific that it's spent on your film. And so like, if it's part of a package and it's promoting your film and it's in a package, it's still promoting it and that's what they're gonna come back to you with, so. How would you even find that out? Word of mouth, you know somebody who knows somebody. Yeah. The question is also if it's if it's worth chasing if it's if the movie's making money and sometimes being a yeah. part of a package doesn't hurt. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes if you're the strong, sometimes you should take pride that you're the strongest film in a package and that they're leveraging you to to do a package because if you hear that, you might just be like, okay, next time they come back to renew my contract, I'm going to make sure that we're like on point on par with what we originally agreed with because I know that my film is still a stud and they're stable and it's still doing work for them. So. That's and I leverage. want a money guarantee. Oh, wow. Another money <laughs> guarantee. That might be hard, but like you might be able to nego renegotiate certain aspects of you know something. Yeah. How do you pick a good legit distribution company to avoid the sketchy ones? So what do you look for in a good distribution company, and uh, how do you avoid the sketchy ones? I think one of my things is the first thing I do. It's a great question. I go on their website and I look at the films that they're talking about. That Oh, we distributed this, we distributed this. And then just Google that film title and see where you can find it in the world. And based on that reach, you're like, okay, it's out on Netflix, that's amazing. It's on iTunes, it's everywhere. Oh, it had a theatrical run back in whenever. That adds some validity to it. You look up, uh, <coughs> this is actually a really interesting way of looking at it, but look at like Glassdoor and other places, look for employees who have worked at that company and what they say about it. Because a lot of times, people won't say anything if it's a good place to work at, but they'll definitely let you know if it's a bad place to work at. And they'll almost nine times out of 10, people will say, this company is taking advantage of filmmakers. So there is some of that perspective out there. And then if you can, um, ask around the industry. Ask anybody you know who has a film that distributed with them. You know, sometimes reach out to the filmmaker. That's a, that to me is Look probably the, the best producers? way to do it. One of the producers or the director, because filmmaker to filmmaker, it's so much easier. Because I could be like, yo, hey, I'm a filmmaker. I'm about to like talk to them. And you'd be like, oh, they're amazing. Like you gotta go with them. Or you could be like, you know what? It's a little rocky. Do you have any other offers? Yeah, I do have a couple more people on the table. Then you kind of have a better perspective. So be informed. Remember, be informed. Wonderful. It's a great question. Any more questions? This may be for consideration more on the studio side, but I've had conversations about like taking your script, whether finished or not, and go start writing a novel on it because it's easier to acquire rights, or it's just like a better way to go. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so taking a film uh, instead of towards, or sorry, is, is you the feature route? Yeah. I just a novel. novel first. It could um, be easier to, to make a script into a novel and then make the movie later? Is yeah, that what you're saying? not necessarily easier writing process, but more yeah. as far as getting the rights. Yeah, so I think I, I see where that advice is coming from because it's less like your script is going to be bought and left in purgatory. Yeah. So it's not going to be like a studio it's just buying up everything just in case like, oh, hey, what do we have in the locker, you know? Let's make this one. If it's a novel and it goes out into the world and somebody's like, we want to acquire the movie rights, this film, or to this book, it's not like, we want to acquire the rights to make it years from now. Like, we want to acquire the rights to try to make it right now. And I know books have gotten locked up. Some of my favorite books have been bought for the movie, but they're just, they can't figure out how to do it. They can't figure it out. I think that question is a little bit more from like the creative perspective, more from like a, a screenwriter's perspective, to be honest with you, because I know it's probably going to take a lot longer to write and publish a novel right. than to just write a screenplay and just try to shop it around, mm -hmm. you know? 
It's easier to say no to a bunch of people who just want to buy your screenplay and throw it in the back room than to you know, and just wait for that person who's going to say yes and here's how we're going to make it in the next two years than to say, I'm going to write a novel that's 300 pages long and then I'm going to go to a publisher and I've never published a book before. <laughs> you know, it's, it's much, I feel like that's a huge workaround, to be honest with you. That's, that's from my production standpoint, less so my distributor, distributor standpoint. So, yeah. It's a good question, though. It's an interesting question, for sure. Wonderful. Any other last questions? One more round? Wonderful. Cool. You guys have been awesome. I know it's a lot of information, so thank you for sticking with me and absorbing it. Thank you. I just wanted to say I really appreciate Adam and Lightbulb for having me out because one of my things that's close to my heart is just making sure that my colleagues, my peers, you guys are informed because I'm still out there trying to make movies too and I know the struggle and I know how hard it can be to make a living. But if we stick together, it can really be a, a cool, um, brave new world for, for independent filmmaking coming up. So if you guys want to reach out just to hang out or if you want to talk shop, please feel free to reach out and we can definitely do that, okay? Keep making. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming out and sharing with us. Um, so uh, Late Nights at Lightbulb is a monthly film series, so if, um, feel free to join us at uh, Lightbulb Grip on either on Facebook or on our website, and so you'll start seeing more of our events coming up. So we're not just talking about production, we're talking about um, everything from uh, camera and lighting techniques and hardware all the way through building your own small business and, and other skills. So next um, month we're coming back, we're going to have another lecture. We're going to be talking about techno cranes, oh. and so that's going to be our next adventure. Um, so yeah, uh, and this video also, um, we're going to put the notes up online, and um, you're going to be able to re-watch this video in probably another two, three weeks on the Apple Box Network, which is a national network for filmmakers talking about film education. So um, I encourage you guys, if you took notes tonight, to review the notes, hopefully in about 24 to 48 hours, because you'll double your retention and how much you remember from what we learned today if you go over your notes again. Wonderful. All right, thank you everybody for coming out. I appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you.